Tonight's broadcast is sponsored by ViMed Healthcare Staffing. ViMed is a leading expert in home-based respiratory care and disease management nationwide. ViMed Healthcare is dedicated to helping patients breathe better and live longer, healthier lives. They are an industry leader in treating respiratory patients in home with full-time respiratory therapists. They focus on education, providing 24-7 support, and lowering readmission rates. ViMed utilizes respiratory therapists as both in-home care providers and patient care coordinators, where you market and educate directly in hospitals. So, if you're looking for a rewarding and great paying alternative to bedside care, please let us know. Send me an email at mail, M-A-I-L, at respiratoryassociates.com, and we'll be happy to pass along your information. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We can, I can hear you. Great. Well, I'm excited about tonight. No better topic on a Sunday night than cardiovascular disease and respiratory care. And just to start by putting some things into perspective for this uh, roughly 90-minute uh, talk tonight, if you think about yourself, whether you're a respiratory therapist that's working in the ICU or on the floors or in an outpatient setting, maybe neopeds, maybe you're in a specialty arena or even in administration somewhere, you truly are a cardiopulmonary scientist. And so when you think about the topic tonight, not only go into it with an open mind, because we do have some on the call, no doubt, 20, 30, maybe 40 years experience and some newer uh, grads or maybe even a student or two. Uh, so we welcome everybody. And with that said, I'll just get into our objectives. Now, these are very general, uh, but hopefully you will leave with something tonight that maybe uh, sparks some thought process that prior you have not revisited in a while, or maybe some things that you had not really been able to digest as you were uh, in respiratory therapy school and you've long left that whole thought process because you're a clinician. Obviously, you're a, a superhero at the bedside. And so uh, with that said, we're going to hopefully describe and classify some just varieties uh, of various cardiovascular diseases. And there are many subcategories. So you have this large umbrella of said cardiovascular disease. And of course, coronary artery disease gets the most uh, attention, it seems like. Uh, but we're going to delve a little deeper tonight. And I want to bring forth some research and evidence-based implications, which I feel are, are very important. If you are a uh, clinician in practice anywhere, you definitely want to stay up to date with what's being uh, published and what is being um, elucidated in the market. Um, I want to discuss respiratory therapy pertinent clinical relevance because that's why you're here. Hopefully you can leave tonight starting uh, your next shift, uh, the next time you work, and you can implement some of these uh, thought processes and maybe even therapies or recommendations. Uh, now keep in mind as a respiratory therapist myself, I clearly understand the barriers that we have many times as a clinician, when we go to bedside and our main attempt is to do good patient care. I mean, the end result is to care for that person that depends upon us. Uh, but there's emerging data that shows we may not need to do the things that we've done in the past the same ways as we've done them. Um, and in recent years, hopefully you'll see some of this data emerge uh, tonight that we'll bring to the forefront. So it's no secret that the leading cause of death, irrespective of gender, irrespective really of ethnicity, of religion, of area of the, the country and the world, that heart disease is the leading cause of death. Here, I just happen to have uh, the World Health Organization's latest statistics. And number one, you have ischemic heart disease. So think about any time that you have someone that comes into the emergency room short of breath, it usually is for one of three reasons. And, and I say this all the time, but you either have a psychosomatic uh, condition where uh, maybe it's you know anxiety or just as the term implies, literally psychosomatic. But other than that, it's either cardiac or respiratory. Uh, when somebody has dyspnea, whether it's upon exertion or not, it's either a, a lung involvement or a cardiac involvement. And you can see to the right here, um, heart disease tops the list as the top 10 leading cause of death in the United States. This is, of course, the Centers for Disease Control. But interestingly enough, if you scroll down in this short uh, graphic here, you can see that um, stroke, diabetes, kidneys, kidney disease, as it's shown, 
they all have a cardiovascular implication. So we like to think about car coronary artery disease. We like to think about chest pain, radiating numbness, shortness of breath, diaphoresis. You know, the 12 lead EKG shows either non-ST elevated myocardial infarction or ST elevated myocardial infarction, but really it goes beyond that. Um, one of the things I'll give you early on here, a clinical nugget, one of the first indicators that someone may have cardiovascular disease, uh, well, I'll save it for here in just a few moments. Keep you on the edge of your seat here on a Sunday night. Uh, please try to hold your excitement to a minimum as we go through here. No, I'm just kidding. Hopefully you've got some coffee or maybe even a stronger drink as we go through here. Uh, so with heart disease in the United States, again, it's no secret across the United States and the world itself, heart disease is the leading cause of death. Notice every gender, it doesn't matter racial background, ethnicity, particularly one person every 36 seconds in the United States dies from cardiovascular disease. That's staggering. And you can see the hundreds of thousands of Americans that die each year. Um, and the latest statistics as far as the financial burden here, 219 billion. But I want to present to you, they recently updated this just in the last few months, in fact, that one person now dies every 34 seconds. So it's getting worse day by day. And we're not at 655,000, we're at almost 700,000 people that are dying from heart disease every year. That's staggering. That's one in four deaths. Now, recently, the COVID statistics have been updated by the Centers for Disease Control, and only because of COVID-19, they're classifying heart disease as the cause of only one in five deaths. So you may say that's improvement, but it's very difficult to tease out whether COVID or the cardiovascular disease really cause uh, death in the end. As you know, we're still learning a lot about the data. Guys, it's serious business. Anytime that you have multiple journals devoted to a topic, devoted to a disease process, devoted to a condition, uh, you know it's a major ordeal. I mean, we have the American Heart Association. Uh, you have multiple journals here. The one to the far left is the Journal of Cardiac Failure. You have an international journal that's similar to the uh, JCF that's more global. Um, you have the European Journal, of course, in circulation. You're probably all familiar with. And we're going to talk a, a little bit about heart failure as we go through, but I want you to think to yourself just for a moment, just take a pause and think about how pervasive cardiovascular disease really is in your clinical practice. I mean, I don't even have to really speculate, although I will for a moment here, just how, what percentage of your patients that you care for, whether they're getting a breathing treatment, an incentive spirometry, whether they're getting an arterial blood gas ordered, or they just come out of surgery, or maybe they're just simply in the recovery room, or let's go home care, or let's go in the educational world where you're talking about case studies. How many of those patients are truly with just respiratory disease? There's not too many. There's not too many at all. In fact, most of the patients we care for arguably have both respiratory and cardiac disease, whether it's strictly cardiovascular or whether it's what we call pump failure, which would be more indicative of heart failure. I mean, the reality check here is on the screen and I should have worn you a graphic image to come here. So just turn away for a moment if you're having a late night snack or maybe you're beginning a shift, having a little breakfast there. Um, what you're seeing here is a typical coronary artery bypass grafting procedure and process. If you look really close, you can actually see here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, you can see uh, a bit of uh, suturing that's going on here. So not only are these patients encountering just a gruesome, almost medieval level of invasive procedure, but the recovery time is prolonged for these patients. Not so much mechanical ventilation time, but there's a long road ahead of them, cardiovascular rehab, um, and, and you've seen the processes if you've been in clinical practice a while. It, it's a major undertaking. And, and what's not really shown or represented on the screen is the fact that we're harvesting vessels from other parts of the body. And of course, blood clots can form, pulmonary emboli, fat emboli, a number of things uh, can truly go awry. And it's unfortunate. Uh, here's another reality. I mean, the first thing that probably uh, hits you square in between the eyes is the fact that this patient has a tremendously large heart. Uh, notice the heart itself is almost filling uh, not only one side of the thorax, but about half the other side. 
And I'll give you a good way clinically that indicates immediate cardiomegaly without using any of the integrated tools that they have on the PAC system or whatever system you may use is look at your right border here, your right spinal border. And unless we have dextrocardia or situs inversus, the cardiac silhouette should be situated downward and slightly towards the left in the left lower portion of the thorax, the left lower quadrant here. And if it's in normal orientation, what we call in situ, you still should not see the right anterior heart border exceed the right margin of the spine. And here clearly we are a significant portion beyond the right margin of the spine here is what I'm tracing in the uh, vertical plane here. So obviously there's cardiomegaly and you can see there is an adjunct device which is penetrating one of the va vasculature here. And you can see that we've got a dual lead pacer um, as well or a pacemaker as it's known. So this patient definitely is in uh, a chronic condition. And the cabbage doesn't always take care of issues for patients, right? Coronary artery bypass grafting, they get new vessels. Uh, we don't like to see four and five vessel cabbages because that tells us that they probably had very advanced disease, uh, but things can be fixed temporarily. Um, what you know, though, is this patient is going to have a long road of recovery ahead of them. And the respiratory therapist is in the front lines many times, not only receiving this patient out of general surgery, but then taking them down the journey to recovery until they get to discharge. And you that work in the home care environment or the long-term acute care or in the emergency department, this patient is at a high risk for returning back for cardiovascular issues. Not all is fixed in the snapshot of time with just one surgery. A couple of things worth noting before we move on here is you want to look for a calcification ring at the aortic knob. That usually indicates cardiovascular disease of some sort. Now they may not manifest symptoms, but one of the first things you should look for besides the heart size, because we are talking about cardiovascular disease tonight, is you should also center in, do you see any calcifications that are obvious in the great vessels? One would be the aortic knob. Uh, usually it's perfectly rounded. I mean, in the uh, cross-sectional plane, as you see here, if the cut is made virtually uh, through the uh, x-ray penetration and, and the imaging, uh, you're going to see a nice round circle. But when you see a calcification ring and you can see just a little remnant here, if you dim the lights where you are, center your focus here, you can see a little calcification. That indicates if I've got calcification in the great vessels, in the largest vessel of the body, which is the aorta, I'm almost guaranteed that I've got calcifications in the microvasculature. And what does that mean to you and I? Well, if I have calcifications in a large vessel, knowing I have them also in small vessels, the end organ ends up underperfused in the end. And another layer to this particular patient worth noting, because I'm assuming most on the call tonight are clinicians, bedside practitioners. When you see somebody with a pacer, that not only integrates the atria, but the ventricles as well, you have a greater issue than if someone just had a, a single a chamber pacer. So this patient is very sick, so to speak. But let's get back to it here. So just to paint the picture, the realistic picture, you're seeing a cadaver that's had the chest wall removed and you have the, uh, looks like most of the parietal pleura as well has been excised. Um, you're seeing the heart as it's anatomically meant to be situated downward and to the lower left in the thorax. It's not perfectly midline. The trachea here is perfectly midline. You can see the aortic knob uh, in this general area, what we just looked at on the x-ray, but now we're seeing it in real human tissue. Um, you've got the branches of the aorta here, the brachiocephalic, left common carotid, left subclavian. But look, it's not an anatomy lecture tonight, right? Move on. I hear you. So when you look at the aortic arch here, it's the largest vessel of the body besides the descending aorta, besides the femoral iliacs. You're dealing with a significant amount of blood volume in the thorax, just at baseline. Not only are you dealing with a significant amount of blood in the great vessels, but all of the lung tissue that you see here, we assume a majority of it to the periphery is well perfused. You have a significant amount of blood volume at all times when you're dealing with the thoracic cavity. Now, the heart and lungs are very intimately connected, as you and I both know. So when you have, a, when you have someone with any type of blood loss, when you have anybody with significantly over distended lung tissue and you've got an increase in resistance to outflow from the heart, it's going to cause the heart some added stress and strain.
What does that mean to you and I? Well, when the heart has added stress or strain, that immediately indicates that the end organs are working harder to receive blood flow. And what are the most oxygen demanding, the most blood demanding organs? There's the brain is at the top of the list. And most of the time, unless the patient has the head of bed flat, the brain is fighting gravity. So we're having to pump against the gravitational pull. There's already a gradient created there. You have the kidneys that are very hungry for oxygen and hungry for blood flow. And we have the epidemic of renal failure in our society, as you and I are well aware. So those are just some things to keep in mind. And do note, you that draw ABGs often, you run it through the machine that has all the options, like your hemoglobin, hematocrit, your electrolytes, uh, your lactic level. Um, anytime that organs are underperfused, anytime you have low oxygen delivery, whether it's because of the transport mechanism, because the blood flow is impaired, or you just have low oxygen as it would be in the bloodstream from a decrease in harvesting at the lung, you're going to develop a degree of lactic acidosis and it can happen very quickly. So start being more aware maybe if you haven't already, when you draw an arterial blood gas and you have the opportunity to draw a lactic acid level, to be acutely aware that as lactic acid levels begin to increase, um, it could be a pure metabolic acidosis and indicate a poor perfusion state overall. Uh, this is just, again, something to emphasize just the very intimate interconnections between the heart and the lung tissue. You can see just how well invested that blood vessels are to the periphery of the lung. And they're, they're feeding off of the heart itself, yes, but mainly the pulmonary artery. Of course, the blood has to pull back into the left heart through the pulmonary vein. There's a lot that takes place. And this doesn't account for somebody on mechanical ventilation that's receiving positive pressure integrated around these very delicate vessels. You've got compression that's occurring during inspiration and decompression that's occurring during expiration. Um, in addition to that, if you've got somebody with hyperinflation or an area that is drawn in upon itself, we call that consolidation, maybe atelectasis, pulmonary collapse, it's going to compress the vessels in a different way. If you've got extrinsic compression on the chest wall, if you've got any type of uh, tumor or investment of soft tissue that's an abnormal lesion, it can compress the lung tissue and therefore compress blood flow uh, to the heart. And you don't know this, but I want to ask you here, if you can see the colors on the screen, what is wrong with this picture? Just take a moment to think about it. What is wrong with this picture? Well, if you look at the color coding, everything looks pretty good. We've got venous return, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava returning to the right atrium here through the right ventricle, up through the right ventricular outflow tract. And we reach the pulmonary arteries, which you and I both know does not contain oxygenated blood until it reaches lung tissue. So this is a great picture for clarity and for just a point of view, but they have their color coding wrong. Luckily, there's a respiratory therapist on the call that called it immediately, right? I know you noticed it. We do not have oxygenated blood flowing through our pulmonary artery under normal circumstances. Now, you neopeds experts on the call, I understand, yes, you can have a patent foramen oval and a patent ductus arteriosus, but that's beyond our call tonight. Uh, so for what it's worth, just take a moment to soak in the very extensive nature of not only the pulmonary vasculature, which is represented here, and if you notice, if I outline it with my cursor, it almost traces the shape of a normal lung, but you have a lot of blood that's flowing from the aortic arch to the uh, carotids, out through the arms, even down, if you look here, the descending aorta to the femoral iliacs and lower extremity. And so there's a lot that can go wrong. And that's really what I want to focus on tonight is just a, maybe a different way of looking at things or just a friendly reminder of some physiologic implications of respiratory care that we do on a daily basis. Uh, before I move on, just another reminder, think about, especially during positive pressure ventilation, how easy it is to compress these delicate vessels. And whether you're compressing the artery or the vein, it's still going to affect how much blood flow ultimately that the heart receives. 
And if you remember back to Starling's principle, oh, let me save it for later because I know it's coming up on a slide. So if you look here, this is a typical chest X-ray of a patient that arguably is probably normal in their lung tissue and even in their vasculature. But the difference here is a catheter has been floated uh, through probably the subclavian to the superior vena cava down into the right atrium, right ventricle, and some contrast dye has been injected to light up the pulmonary vasculature. So what you're seeing here is a very beautiful rendition with uh, utmost clarity of the pulmonary artery and the branches thereof. So just take a moment to soak it in because we like to pull up a chest X-ray. We like to glance and we like to say, oh, they've got prominent pulmonary vasculature. Or we might look at a chest X-ray and they say they've got hazy infiltrates. But we, you and I have got to realize that what we're looking at here, yes, it's under contrast medium, but you're having the opportunity for really an appreciation of just how extensive that the vasculature is embedded within the lung tissue, that intimate connection all the way to the periphery of the lung. Well, we often see Boulay disease, we see atelectasis, we see lobar pneumonias, we see pleural effusions that are displacing lung tissue and compressing these very delicate structures. So just think about it. If you were to be you know, washing someone's vehicle with a garden hose without a nozzle and somebody walked by and they stepped on the hose, you'd have less water escaping uh, beyond the obstruction. But what do you have prior to that obstruction? You have pressure that begins to build. It's really not that much different when we talk about the cardiovascular system. The more gradient of pressure resistance that the heart is pumping against, the harder the muscle has to work. And you and I, we go to the gym sometimes once a year during January, especially, surely, right? And we try to, you know, work our muscles so they uh, get more efficient and they get larger. Well, the heart does get more efficient and, and can get larger to a certain degree, but past a certain point, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment, it becomes inefficient because the key is the heart has to refill with adequate volume during diastolic relaxation in order for systolic contraction to be effective. You can't have the heart overloaded with fluid and expect a muscle that's over distended to pump with adequate efficiency. So take a moment just to look at what we have here. We have, and I tried to give us a little point of view of maybe an area where you work often or, or maybe it's your favorite area. Uh, but needless to say, every patient that you see on the screen here is very different. Upper left, we have the morbidly obese patient, most likely is non-ambulatory without significant assistance. Maybe they're in a rehabilitation uh, situation. They're obviously not in a typical ICU scenario where they're on mechanical ventilation. Upper right, someone's intubated. You can see the uh, bite blocker. Is that an oropharyngeal airway? Hopefully you're not using an OPA as a bite block, but it looks like there's some sort of bite blocker airway device there in addition to the ET tube. Uh, bottom left, someone obviously not feeling very well, but they're in a high Fowler's position, not hooked up to too much monitoring. I'm assuming maybe floor care. Uh, you've got the young lady at the bottom uh, middle that um, is on a nasal cannula. She could be in ICU, she could be in recovery, she could be headed to surgery. And then bottom right, you have the gentleman that's being auscultated, of course, by the respiratory therapist. We never miss an opportunity to auscultate, right? And this gentleman is on a non-rebreather mask. So what I'm trying to, to make the point here is everyone you see here is quite different. They all have some degree of cardiovascular disease in the scenario I'm attempting to paint, but the setting is very different. The opportunity for intervention is very different. And even their presentation and the way that we treat this patient should be quite different. I'm not talking about treating them different because you know the patient and they're a VIP, they're a frequent flyer, they're non-compliant. I'm saying you've got to approach each patient slightly different because their realm of cardiovascular disease may be quite different. Upper left, you've got the patient that most likely has hyperlipidemia, that most likely has hypercholesterolinemia, that most likely has diabetes mellitus type 2. I don't know that the young lady in the middle has all those risk factors. And sometimes we're not privy to, to the laundry list on the electronic health record. But there are some things that you should note when you deal with patients with suspected cardiovascular disease. For one, their heart may not be maximally efficient just by giving them a bit of oxygen therapy. And likewise, you've got some patients, believe it or not, that are more efficient when placed on mechanical ventilation because you've suddenly begun to prop up the weak, dilated, and floppy heart. We'll come back to some of these thought processes.
So general types of heart disease, we're all familiar with what's known as just general cardiovascular disease. Um, probably you're very familiar with coronary artery disease, which happens to be the most common form of the general version of heart disease. But cardi coronary artery disease can be broken down into four subcategories as shown here. You've got coronary heart disease that literally affects just the coronary perfusion, the widow maker as it's called, left anterior descending, the right coronary. You've got, the, of course, the circumflex and the marginal arteries. But we're talking about when we say coronary artery disease, specifically coronary heart disease, you're referring to the blood vessels that actually perfuse the heart muscle that do not necessarily participate directly in systemic circulation. So let's make that clear. You have a separate system of perfusion that feeds the muscle of the heart itself, allowing therefore the heart to pump and to feed the rest of systemic circulation. Um, we all see stroke on an almost daily basis, depending on what area of the hospital you work. If you're outside the hospital, certainly you've dealt with patients that have a history of stroke or what we call cerebrovascular accident, the CVA. It can be hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic. Then we have peripheral arterial disease, also known generally as peripheral vascular disease. And I'm down here, um, if you're following along on the screen on these subcategories. And then we have specific aortic atherosclerosis, as I alluded to earlier with that calcification ring in the aortic knob. So I want you to think about if I've got calcification in my aorta, I'm suddenly decreasing the surface area through which blood can flow in the largest vessel of the body that is almost exclusively responsible for perfusing, perfusing the lower extremity. It's really a daunting thought process. And of course, what doesn't get as much of the limelight that's on the list here at the bottom is the arrhythmia. If the heart is out of sync and it's not beating properly and systolic contraction isn't happening in sync with what uh, filling, the end of filling has, uh, has completed and, and now it's time to contract, you can have decreased cardiac output overall. And again, it's the end organs that are suffering. But wait, there's more. And uh, interestingly enough, this Billy Mays here died of a myocardial infarction. It was a cocaine-induced myocardial infarction, but an MI nonetheless. So let's look at this study here. And I, I had a lot more granular notes. I can't even see my notes tonight. So I'm just going off of what I remember here. Um, I've got the important stuff on the screen. So you've got a, a very large scale study that was done roughly three years ago, give or take a few months. And they actually looked at well over 100,000 uh, patients, and they divided them up into COPD, they divided them up into asthma, they divided them into a category of interstitial lung disease. And what you're seeing here is their, uh, their conclusion. And you can see what's part of this whole idea of cardiovascular disease is heart failure. And they're saying that lung disease is independently associated with cardiovascular diseases, and they contribute significantly to all cause mortality. In other words, someone with cardiovascular disease, you can rubber stamp that person, they are going to be at higher risk for death. And what I found interesting here, I didn't highlight it, it's on the screen, patients with lung disease are less likely to receive coronary revascularization. I don't know the reason behind that. Um, you know, you see the cabbage patient, the coronary artery bypass grafting patient all the time. Um, but for whatever reason, there are 100,000 plus uh, subjects that they studied um, in this particular research. They did not find that uh, patients with lung disease had as much cardiovascular surgery. Could it be because they're just not uh, compliant? I don't know. So this is just something that I, I feel like gets its own slide here tonight. Patients with combination cardiovascular, this is our patients on a daily, and pulmonary disease. Yes, they're very complex. And it's easy to say that, well, you know, most of our patients are going to have, yes, several different diseases beyond respiratory um, impairment, but you're seeing a lot more patterns develop. I tell our students all the time, we go to clinical rotations, go ahead and get ready to look up these diseases once they start showing up time and again, because they're not going to go away. You can't avoid becoming an expert at cardiovascular disease, at heart failure, 
at hyperlipidemia, hypercholesterolemia, congestive heart failure. You're seeing this triad of diabetes, heart failure, along with respiratory disease, and you're going to continue to see this combo. Part of that reason is there's that intimate connection between the great vessels, the microvasculature in the thoracic cavity, and the heart and lung. Uh, together. So you that intubate, you that work in critical care and an ICU environment, even in general surgery recovery, you're well aware that we change everything when we place somebody on mechanical ventilation. And I want you to just think for a moment, you and I that are spontaneous breathing tonight on the call, anytime that air is entering our lung tissue, it's because of negative pressure that develops, negative pressure in the alveoli. And that is created by the diaphragm contracting. It descends downward, makes our thoracic cavity larger. And according to Boyle's law, if you increase volume, you decrease pressure. So we have negative intraalveolar pressure that's created under spontaneous conditions. But we do the exact opposite. It is completely anti-physiologic to place somebody on positive pressure during inspiration. It's completely opposite of what normal spontaneous breathing uh, experiences. So with that said, what are we doing when we place somebody on positive pressure? We're passively, actively, it does not matter the PEEP level or the volume or the pressure control level. You are increasing pressure on the surrounding vessels. Now we know as the lung tissue expands, so do the uh, conducting airways. And, and to a certain degree, there can be some tethering that occurs to cause dilation of the vesculature uh, when you're doing mechanical ventilation, but there has to be an end expiratory state. And if positive pressure is maintained, just think every time that you intubate someone and you place them on mechanical ventilation, you are increasing pressure inside of the thorax and therefore you are creating pressure upon the surrounding vessels. Remember that very intimate connection. Very, very important. So this is a schematic many years ago. Well, I'll say many. It's not quite 10. About a decade ago. Sounds so long ago. Um, there was a, a really interesting schematic. Quite simple if you look here. Uh, but what we're trying to understand as a respiratory therapist, when you first look at mechanical ventilation, of course, now, you know, you've been doing it a while, you're an expert, but when you first start looking at mechanical ventilation, you have to wrap your mind around, we're doing something completely opposite of normal physiology. And when you do that, you cannot expect a normal outcome. Uh, there was a campaign by the American Lung Association a few years back that says, every cigarette is doing you harm. Well, now we know that every positive pressure breath in some form or fashion is doing a patient harm. Now, we don't have very many more options outside of positive pressure ventilation, and we've learned how to manipulate it to be safer. But we're trying to decrease stress and strain as much as possible. And one reason we're doing that is because what you see here on the screen. Now, pleural pressure should be negative at all times. We are uh, naturally in a vacuum in our pleural space. You have the lung tissue that is separated uh, from the thoracic cavity by a membrane and a small amount of fluid. You have the lung tissue that is surrounded by a visceral pleura, and you have the uh, parietal pleura that lines the interior of the thoracic cavity. But that envelope, it moves uh, sort of like a slide and a, a cover slip would on a drop of water, if you look at a microscope, uh, just as an example. But uh, back to the point here, the pleural pressure should always be slightly negative. Well, during positive pressure ventilation at certain time during the respiratory cycle, the pleural pressure can become slightly positive just for a, a portion of a second. And what this does, anytime you put positive pressure in the alveoli, this is an increase in airway pressure, you're going to decrease some of the blood flow to the left heart. And anytime that we have a decrease in left ventricular filling, even if systolic contraction is adequate, you've got less to work with. It's sort of like saying everyone loves to shop. We just came out of the holiday season. You know, I can give you a thousand dollars or I can give you a hundred dollars. You're going to do a little more shopping, I would assume, with the thousand dollars, but you can still shop if you're only given a hundred. Well, a heart that's working properly, even if we place somebody on mechanical ventilation, 
Um, it can contract during systole and pump out the blood that's available, but the less blood that's available, the less cardiac output you're going to get. And that, that goes without saying, but it's worth a friendly reminder. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in the 90s. Wow, what a great decade. And you can see here quite simply, it's showing you a visual of alveolar expansion from positive pressure and what it does to the pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, PVR is what the right heart experiences as a gradient against which it is pumping. Uh, in other words, as the right heart squeezes, there's going to be some degree of resistance uh, that the heart has to overcome to push blood forward. Now, the one-way valves are quite helpful, the atrioventricular valves and, of course, the venous valves to keep blood moving relatively continuous, but that systolic contraction is so important. So here, we're putting pressure. If you see the screen, I'll go back one. So just, you know, if you've kind of uh, taken a little brain break here to grab a coffee, if you'll glance again, I'll, I'll do it here. The alveolus is compressing the surrounding pulmonary vasculature. Well, you've got all of this venous blood that's trying to reach the alveoli to become oxygen. Well, you've got a bolus that may be delivered to the point of oxygenation, but thereafter, there's very uh, little that gets through to the left ventricle, and therefore, you have less total cardiac output. This is sort of where um, non-congestive heart failure can occur, and the patient begins to present with jugular venous distension. They begin to present with pedal edema. This would be an example, what you're seeing on the screen here of somebody that is developing right heart failure. There's nothing wrong with the right heart here to start. The problem is because fluid begins to back up in the right heart prior to the lung tissue, you get an overload of the system. And when any muscle is overstretched, it cannot contract properly. And if my right ventricle isn't putting out the normal amount of blood, then you can be guaranteed my left ventricle has very little option to receive an adequate amount of blood, and therefore my cardiac output is impaired. You and I deal with this on a daily basis, whether we realize it or not. So the question is, how much PEEP is too much. And is there anything such as physiologic PEEP? Well, I'm here to tell you, we do not have physiologic PEEP. You and I at normal spontaneous level and during spontaneous breathing normally off of mechanical ventilation, just breathing room air, even on oxygen therapy, as long as we're not on a ventilator, we are at zero centimeters of water pressure at end expiration. What keeps our alveoli passively inflated at the end of expiration, also known as at functional residual capacity, is the oppositional forces between the surrounding thoracic cavity that wants to expand outward at rest and the alveoli of the lung tissue that wants to contract inward at rest. How do you think the negative intrapleural pressure is created? Well, you and I both know it's created by the oppositional tethering, the forces going one way versus the other between the thoracic cavity and the alveoli. So the question is, how much PEEP is too much? Well, Rarely do we place somebody on zero centimeters of water pressure PEEP because we understand if they're sick enough to need mechanical ventilation, they probably need some assistance in splinting their lung tissue open, but it's a fine line. It's a gray area, and there is a certain point at which it's difficult to pinpoint at which they fall off the cliff, right? And suddenly you start noticing they're desaturating because we've increased PEEP. Well, some of that can be resolved by giving a fluid bolus or putting them on a positive inotrope, and you say, well, we don't have the autonomy always to make that recommendation, and I agree, but an awareness is a good starting point. And just having that discussion, I can almost guarantee you, now it doesn't happen in every scenario, but I can almost guarantee you, there's very few ordering providers, physicians, NPs, uh, PAs, that don't appreciate someone looking outside of their arena every once in a while. If you see something, say something. Anytime you're increasing PEEP, on a patient on mechanical ventilation, and you start noticing that oxygen saturation is dropping down, if nothing else can be pinpointed as a cause of that desaturation, most likely you have overdistended the alveoli to the point you've compressed the surrounding vasculature, and suddenly now we've got right heart pressures increasing and left heart pressures decreasing. So cardiac output is ultimately decreasing. Always be aware of that as you're placing somebody on mechanical ventilation, particularly if you're beginning to titrate PEEP. And don't be afraid of a little PEEP. We've got ways we can monitor that. But let's go back in time for just a moment. 
This was a study done 1947, which if I recall, happened to be the year, I believe the precursor to the AARC, the American Association for Respiratory Care was founded. They used to be called the American Association of Inhalation Therapy. Uh, but here we are uh, from 1947 and, and check out the, the title here, Physiological Studies of the Effects of Intermittent Positive Pressure Breathing on Cardiac Output in Man. I mean, what about woman? What is this, 1947? Well, actually it was. Uh, but what you can see here, they, they tested three types of breath delivery. Uh, type one I have highlighted symmetrical with gradual increasing and decreasing slope. Hey, that sounds like a sine wave, doesn't it? Type two, asymmetrical with rapidly increasing pressure during inspiration. That sounds like what we do on the daily in modern day mechanical ventilation. And then type three, asymmetrical with gradually increasing pressure during inspiration and suddenly dropping early in expiration atmospheric. That also sounds like a type of mechanical ventilation that we do today. And what they found is there's really not that much difference between the ways that we ventilate. If you put somebody on positive pressure, the take home point is you're going to decrease cardiac output. That's been the case for many years. Uh, anybody ever watched Sanford and Son, a good old throwback? You ever up late at night flipping through? Uh, you can find Sanford and Son. He, he was famous for always holding his chest and saying, it's the big one, it's the big one. But not all patients that we care for encounter the big one before they have the manifestations and symptomology of cardiovascular disease. Sometimes it's discreet. It comes about over many months and years of time. And just, just worth noting here, um, if for you out there that that like to stay up on, on what's being uh, published, uh, certainly you didn't miss this one from October 2002, I assume. Uh, but they have a, a statement here. This is a systematic review from the uh, Cochrane Library. Uh, now, it's published uh, about 20 years ago, so we've known this for a long time. But there's still this misconception, this myth, if you will, out there that uh, beta blockers are not going to allow our medications to work properly, where you're going to see more and more patients being put on beta blockers. And so it's helpful, just uh, feel worth mentioning. And here's their summary. Cardioselective beta blockers given in mild to moderate reversible airways disease or COPD do not produce adverse respiratory effects. Remember, cardioselective beta blockers are not just generalistic beta blockers, and you have very specific beta-2 adrenergic agonists that are given as a bronchodilator. Uh, especially if you're maybe a student on the call, this is a myth that floats around from time to time, but any, any clinician worth their metal knows that uh, certain medications that have receptor site specificity, they do their job and they don't do outside of what they're meant uh, to do. Here's another great study on uh, the safety of cardioselective beta-1 blockers in asthma. Now, certainly, if you're dealing with an asthmatic patient, you want to be guaranteed that that patient, if they have cardiovascular compromise and they happen to be on a beta blocker, that they're still going to respond to a beta-2 adrenergic agonist for bronchodilation. Well, this was done just a couple of years back. I would say less than a year and a half, actually. We just turned over to 2023. This was a literature review, and they looked at a number of studies. Again, um, I don't have the granular data listed here, but I've got their, their uh, summary, if you will. No published reports on cardioselective beta-1 blockers causing asthma death. And observational data even suggests that cardioselective beta-1 blocker use is not associated with an increase in asthma exacerbation. It is worth noting that if someone happens to be on a beta agonist and uh, the ordering provider, let's say, orders an additional beta agonist, there, there should be good reason for that. Uh, you don't want to double up or you know double or triple the dose outside of an acute exacerbation unless it's a very specific uh, circumstance. So as mentioned earlier, just to, to put it in a very simple point of view, this is how my mind works. If you are washing a vehicle, just like you see here. And you do not have a spray nozzle, just as you see here. And I mean, if you've got kids like I do running around, who knows where the spray nozzle was? We have to buy one about every three weeks, it seems like in the summertime. But this gentleman is holding the end of the hose and he wants there to be an increase in vo flow velocity. What is he doing? He's compressing the outlet with his thumb. What he's essentially doing is he's He's exploiting one of the laws of physics that if I decrease the radius, or let's just say the diameter in this case, um, to get the same amount of volume through, it has to move quicker.
Well, the problem in the cardiovascular system is you're not dealing with the size of a garden hose. You're dealing with very small entities. So any decrease in cross-sectional area, any resistance, any external compression, such as you're seeing here, that occurs is going to cause, if volume is going to move through at the same amount over time, it's going to have to move through quicker. In fact, the definition of volume over time mathematically is flow, volume over time flow. So if I step on a hose that's containing fluid, uh, prior to the obstruction here, pressure begins to build. And you can see the widening of the tube. Obviously, it's holding more pressure. And beyond the obstruction, receives less flow and therefore less pressure. It's not that much different on mechanical ventilation, specifically positive pressure ventilation. As soon as we place somebody, whether it's non-invasive, whether it's via tracheostomy, um, interface, that's the term I was going for, whether it's on a, uh, a typical endotracheal tube, it doesn't matter, nasally intubated, but if I place somebody on a closed loop system, relatively sealed on positive pressure, every inspiratory effort that they make, that they receive a burst of flow, whatever the flow rate might be, whether it's pressure control or volume control, maybe it's not set, maybe it's uh, gauged by the machine through real-time biofeedback and servo control, but they're receiving positive pressure you're going to see an instant decrease in a majority of patients in not only uh, left ventricular outflow, but cardiac output systemically. Now, you may see an increase in right heart pressure, but it does not mean that you have an increase in right heart output. So here's a very interesting study uh, published in the British Medical Journal. Uh, been a few years ago, but it still holds true today. And we've known this for many years. This is the point I'm trying to make is it's not new knowledge necessarily, but every once in a while, we need a re friendly reminder. And there's been more added to this um, in recent years, but mechanical ventilation independently affects the key determinants of cardiovascular performance. Now, let me just say early on here that blood flow is relatively continuous through our body. Um, in fact, we only really depend upon atrial contraction, systolic squeeze for that 30% called atrial kick that delivers into our ventricle. If the atria are failing, i.e. atrial fibrillation, we see it all the time on patients that are relatively asymptomatic until they have an event, um, blood flow is relatively continuous. We have those one-way venous valves that keep us moving in the right direction. We have the atrioventricular valves that unless there's a significant leak, it keeps blood flow moving in the right direction. But needless to say, if the atria are unable to fill properly, then systolic contraction and the atria squeeze, even if it's occurring at a normal rate, if it's occurring at a normal level, you've still got less delivered to the ventricle. And it's the ventricle that primarily determines cardiac output, the left in particular. Um, so here you see the impedance to ventricular emptying or afterload. Afterload is just resistance. And then you've got heart rate and myocardial contractility. Key point here, pressures remain greater than atmospheric pressure throughout the respiratory cycle, even if someone is on zero positive expiratory pressure. Even if you have a physician, an ordering provider, an RT who places somebody on zero of PEEP, if they are on a closed loop system receiving high flow velocity on mechanical ventilation, they're going to be supra atmospheric during the entire respiratory cycle. One of the most famous pulmonologists in the actual uh, globe, but certainly here in the U.S., uh, Dr. Tobin, um, who's called in as an expert witness on all the high, high profile cases. Um, he had a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine in the early 90s. And here's just a summary of that particular review article. Positive pressure ventilation usually lowers cardiac output. Well, as I mentioned, we've known this since 1947, primarily as a result of decreased venous return. So there's less blood flow into the right atrium and therefore into the right ventricle. Well, what do those entities feed? They feed the lung tissue. So if I've got less return to the right heart, there's absolutely no way that I'm going to have normal left ventricular output. Here's the kicker though, and it's on the screen. Conversely, this form of ventilation can actually increase cardiac output in patients with impaired cardiac contractility because there is a decrease in that left ventricular afterload. 
So here's the thought process. There are certain patients. Now, it's not a, a large portion of the general population that you deal with, but there's a small portion of patients that uh, the best analogy I, I can think of is it would be like the feeble person that has trouble walking even with a cane or a walking assist device. But if you prop them against the wall, they have a lot easier time uh, ambulating. Um, it, it's not that much different in a small portion of patients when we place them on mechanical ventilation because suddenly they have splinting. They are being propped up, so to speak, internally that they actually do better. So when you see somebody that uh, has advanced cardiovascular disease and they're in this, uh, this niche population that benefit, uh, you're going to see it immediately when you place them on mechanical ventilation. And I'm not talking about just because their oxygenation goes up. Yes, oxygen and PEEP can do that. But if they have cardiovascular monitoring, that's when you really begin uh, to appreciate it. Uh, another rare, uh, fairly famous physician here, Dr. Pinsky, you can see uh, published in Chess in 2005, um, and, and I don't remember the, the exact number of, of subjects here. Again, forgive me. I thought I would have uh, my notes for you tonight. But here's, this, here's the summary of the study. Positive pressure ventilation increases intrathoracic pressure and increases in intrathoracic pressure. We know decreased left ventricular afterload. But here is another addition to uh, the study we just looked at from 1994. He's saying in patients with fluid overload, basically hypervolemic heart failure, the afterload reducing effect can result again in improved left ventricular ejection fraction. What I'm saying is it's not anything necessarily new, but maybe a new way of thinking. As a respiratory therapist, when you're dealing with somebody with advanced hypervolemic heart failure, fluid overload, those that come in with, uh, you know, pulmonary edema, those that are well known to be fluid overloaded, maybe mechanical ventilation is going to allow their cardiac output to increase in the short term, rather than being so uh, hesitant of placing that person on mechanical ventilation because we are afraid of, of compressing the vasculature. Just another way of thinking. Uh, I want to invite you on this slide to, to literally think uh, differently. Now, this was a, a publication from 2016, the Journal of Cardiovascular uh, Development and Disease, and they've got some recommended ventilator settings. I mean, we all love these lists. As long as they're evidence-based, we love these simple charts that we can follow. The thing that should immediately jump out to you that is completely uh, contradictory to ARGENET protocol, that's completely contradictory to probably 99.5% of all published data is this tidal volume range here, but you have to center in on what they're really summarizing. They're saying that this is recommended ventilator settings for patients with heart failure, specifically with reduced ejection fraction. So you've got tidal volume recommendation of eight mils per kg predicted body weight. Now, let me be clear what data shows overall in non-heart failure, non-reduced ejection fraction patient population we're looking at a recommendation of about four to seven mils per kg, and that's been well published. But what I want to present tonight as a reminder, and this data is well published in other arenas as well, is if you have somebody with specific heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, they do recommend higher tidal volumes. That's back to that propping the heart up, splinting the heart that is weak, floppy, dilated, if you want to think about it more technical. But like, let's go back here. What, what exactly is heart failure? I mean, just like anything that fails, it is abnormally uh, operating. It is not behaving as it would uh, be meant to behave, as it would be expected to behave. And so it really just sort of like uh, ARDS, like SIRS, like all these syndrome, it is a clinical syndrome. And heart failure is usually classified uh, according to form and function. So it describes the ana anatomical changes and the deranged function of the heart itself. And so this is a really nice summative statement I try to tease out uh, for you guys tonight. That's uh, it's a consensus document. And you know, when that happens, there's a lot of meetings that take place. Uh, this one just happens to be uh, the Heart Failure Society here in the United States, European Society of Cardiology, and then the Japanese Heart Failure uh, Society. So they're saying clinical syndrome with symptoms or signs caused by the structural and functional cardiac abnormality. And one thing worth noting, I'm not going to spend any time on it tonight, is the 
uh, brain naturetic peptide, the BNP value. You're going to see more and more of the BNP values elevated in our patients coming into the emergency department uh, that are short of breath. They have uh, immense dyspnea and their 12 lead EKG may look normal. Look at their BNP uh, value. One of the only times that BNP, well, I said we weren't going to discuss it. I'll, I'll get into a little bit more, then we'll move on. Uh, the brain naturetic peptide value usually increases when the ventricle is over distended and strained. And that's a good indicator that the heart is overloaded and that the patient may be in heart failure. So let's do a throwback here to all of you who have been through RT school or been in any physiology course. Surely you've talked about cardiac output in detail and the terms preload, afterload, and contractility are always mentioned. Easiest way to think about preload is gas in the tank. It's what you have to work with. Contractility is the strength of the engine. It's the squeeze. And then afterload is the resistance against which the heart must pump to push fluid, in this case, blood flow uh, from one area to the next. So preload is very important. Think about venous return, think about vascular uh, status, but more or less fluid status, what we call uh, fluid status of the venous return, that right heart filling. A contractility would be that systolic squeeze, the strength of the muscle itself. And then afterload, you have afterload on the right side and you have afterload on the left side. So right-sided heart afterload would be pulmonary vascular resistance and left-sided heart load would be systemic vascular resistance. Now the simple equation for calculating cardiac output is at the top here, stroke volume times heart rate. And what's worth mentioning is you and I, regardless of your age, your max heart rate is 220 minus your age in general. And so what I want you to think about just for a moment, and I know it's Sunday night, it's approaching eight o'clock, everybody needs their CEU and, and you're going to get it, but I want you to leave with some things you can use. So when you walk into the patient's room, whether it be ICU or anywhere there's monitoring, and you have the luxury of seeing that patient's resting heart rate in the gurney, whether they're in distress or not, as soon as you see their heart rate, in your mind, you need to do 220 minus their age. If they're at a resting state, let's say you're dealing with a 75-year-old patient. Oh, man, I'm challenging myself in math here, but I, maybe I can pull out my trusty calculator. You're dealing with a 75-year-old patient, and you walk into that patient's room, and their resting heart rate is 130. They're roughly 15 beats a minute from being completely maxed out. Now, if you're looking at a patient that's relaxed and resting, maybe even they're sedated, or hopefully they're not pharmacologically paralyzed, but they're still doing that in some places as needed. But what I'm trying to say is if you see a patient near their max heart rate and they're at a resting state, if, that, if their body becomes distressed, if they suddenly become stressed in any way, um, they're going to max out and, and they're going to be in trouble, especially if they have a history of cardiovascular disease and very little uh, wiggle room, so to speak, and they're decompensated, they can go into cardiac arrest very quickly. I think this needs a slide by itself, and I'm just going to let it sit just a moment for you here. All cardiovascular conditions, no matter what medication that they're on, if it's a cardiac med, it's going to some degree alter either preload, afterload, or contractility, and it may do a little of all three. One of the most common medications that's been around for many years, it's relatively inexpensive, but unfortunately, um, it can be highly toxic, is digoxin or digitalis, uh, affectionately known as DIG. It affects preload, afterload, and contractility. Now you've got some like beta blockers that mainly affect contractility. You've got some like ACE inhibitors that mainly, you've got, you know, the, um, what's the one off the top of my head here? Oh, the diuretic Lasix, everybody knows about spirosamide, right? Well, it's going to affect primarily preload. So just think about these patients that have cardiovascular disease and they're on medications that try to alter one of these for the benefit ultimately of the patient's cardiac output in the end but it's a, a very tedious process. So looking what you have here is just myocytes. You have cardiac muscle tissue. Now, cardiac muscle tissue is very similar to skeletal muscle, and it's not too dissimilar to smooth muscle, although it is striated. But what you have with cardiovascular muscle tissue is you have the sharing of myofibrils. And there's a single nucleus, but you notice they're joined end on end. You also have what are known as intercalated discs. 
these stripes that are showing up perpendicular to the long axis of the muscle fiber. What this allows is an area of low resistance at which when the heart depolarizes, when the heart muscle itself becomes awakened and that wave of depolarization occurs, it's going to be very efficient in moving downward uh, and in situ downward into the lower left where systolic contraction can occur. It's very different tissue than skeletal muscle or smooth muscle tissue. One thing about myocardial tissue, unfortunately to date, it cannot be regenerated. Now there are ongoing studies, many thereof, that are investigating the possibility of stem cell implants. And there's been a few, and uh, the scientist's name escapes me currently, but there's a few ongoing, uh, one in particular in the United States that's got world renown, uh, but they haven't really still figured out a way to implant stem cells into the heart and have them be uh, sustainable over more than just a few days or, or a week or so. So when myocardial tissue dies, it ultimately is dead. That's when, when someone has a heart attack, it's bad news. I mean, there's only so much that collateral blood flow can allow if the muscle tissue itself is necrotic. And that's why when someone comes in with chest pain, they usually get uh, the fast ticket to the back of the ER, right? They go right to the room. Uh, same with the stroke patient. Uh, once again, uh, it's not an uh, anatomy uh, talk tonight necessarily as much as it is physiology, um, but no doubt most everyone on the call could probably label everything you see here. But what I want to concentrate on is just the major difference between the right and left ventricle. Um, the venous system is more of a capacitance system and the arterial system is more of a uh, responsible uh, system of, of pumping and delivering. Uh, so when you have the right side of the heart, although it is the venous return of the body, it, it's still the main responsibility to feed the lung tissue. So when you have somebody in right heart failure, the major problem is we're already at a deficit prior to even lung delivery. And we still have to make it back to the left side where systemic circulation um, occurs. And we have the uh, body upper extremity fed by the aortic arch and the lower extremity fed by the descending aorta. So it's just a lot to take in. And anatomically, it's worth noting that the left side of the heart is about three times as thick as the right side, and that's normal. But this heart muscle can only become so thickened to a point at which the chamber itself can no longer fill adequately. When I say fill, I mean F-I-L-L. -L. Uh, certainly the patient does not F-E-E-L as good as they should. Um, that was a, a bad joke. So when it comes to the uh, left side of the heart here, the heart is almost in distensible. It's surrounded by a fibrous pericardium that has very high tensile strength and almost no compliance. So anytime that fluid accumulates around the heart, there's very little stretching outward that the surrounding pericardial tissue can accomplish, and therefore you get inward compression. And I just want to be sure I make that point before we move along. This is just a really good example of what a valve replacement may look like. And if you look really closely here, this is not artifact. These are sutures that are invested into the heart itself during the procedure. And uh, some of you would probably recognize if you use this particular model of device at your institution, the old Yonker suction. Um, uh, again, it's just a very, a very invasive process to take someone's chest cavity uh, to breach, open it up, high potential for pneumothoraces, um, but you start penetrating the heart muscle itself, and, and there's a lot of recovery involved. Again, any time that heart tissue is damaged, it's near impossible for regeneration to occur without some, uh, you know, intervention, so to speak. There can be collateral circulation through spontaneous neogenesis that occurs, but you don't have any tissue that just spontaneously regenerates. Once it's deteriorated and dead, it's just gone. Um, here's another example, and you can see all of the blood that's being um, delivered and some that's being drained here, and just some of the suturing that's occurring. I mean, look how large that that uh, wire-enforced catheter is. It's probably as big as an ET tube, and it's penetrating the heart temporarily during some of these procedures. Well, we've talked a, a little bit about heart failure, but let's just look in short here at some of the classifications. And you notice they're classified by Roman numeral one to four to your far left, and also um, letters A through D. So a class 1A would be someone with a, a diagnosis of heart failure, probably just from uh, diagnostic imaging and maybe 
uh, some sort of uh, historical symptomology, but nothing that necessarily gives an outward manifestation. And then you have the worst case scenario, which would be a 4D classification. So if you're privy to this information in the electronic health record at your institution, um, hopefully it creates a little bit of point of view. I mean, look at class 4D here just for a moment. Unable to carry on any physical activity without discomfort. Symptoms of heart failure at rest. These are some people that they don't want to do anything. It's just a cycle of sedentary lifestyle because they can't breathe if they move. And you can see objective evidence of severe cardiovascular disease. This will be things like probably resting, elevated BNP. Um, some of these patients even have a troponin level that's slightly elevated, and it does not necessarily mean that they're having an active heart attack. Uh, we saw this a lot with COVID as well. So one key consideration, I think, clinically, to put it into perspective for everyone here, uh, including myself, I need to be reminded of these things because I deal with patients that have all, not only respiratory disease, but cardiovascular disease. One liter of body fluid weighs about 2.2 pounds of physical body weight. And you often see patients, especially in the emergency department, and, and I keep coming back to the ICUs, it's just when you see the, the most critically ill by name um, in clinical practice. And they'll come in, they'll start their treatment, and it may be 24, 40 hours later, and you, if you look closely, you'll notice that they suddenly lose 10, 12. I've seen them lose 20 pounds in two days. It's not because they were taking in so many calories and suddenly they're just not taking in food. I mean, we don't starve patients on purpose. And even if you did, you're not going to lose, you know, more than a few ounces, maybe a pound or two a day. So center in, you start seeing these patients with cardiovascular disease, especially heart failure, or what we like to call congestive heart failure, and they're rapidly gaining or losing weight in the hospital when they're not able to eat and they're being tube fed, then it's most likely fluid. And now you can quantify that very easily by this conversion factor. Here's an example of what I alluded to a little bit earlier. You can see uh, the right ventricle here and the left ventricle, of course, in the hypertrophic cardiomyopic heart. You have a very uh, thickened heart muscle. Well, what does this essentially do? Yes, it makes the muscle able to contract possibly with greater force under normal circumstances, but the problem lies in the fact that the chamber itself is compromised. You can tell there's so much more blood that can be integrated into the left ventricle at rest in the normal heart versus here in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathic heart. And the case is, if I have less surface area for blood to fill, I have less potential for output when the heart muscle contracts. And that's a major problem. Now, not everybody with cardiomegaly necessarily has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Sometimes fluid overload will give the um, optical illusion of significant cardiomegaly, but it's temporary. Um, I find this so interesting. If you can really get back to the, the whole way that coronary artery disease uh, develops. And, and there's a difference between arteriosclerosis and arthrosclerosis. Um, arteriosclerosis is literal hardening of the arteries and arthrosclerosis is when plaque just begins to build up um, over time and, and produces what's known as an atheroma. Uh, what you're seeing here to the far right is not a jelly donut, although that sounds pretty good right about now. You're seeing some lipids integrated into the wall itself and the intimal lining, the endothelial cells have actually covered that lipid to sort of produce this large bolus, this lesion that decreases significantly the cross-sectional area through which blood is flowing. If you remember way back when to Pessoy's law, if you decrease the radius of any lumen, there's going to be a significant decrease in flow. Before we move on from this slide, what's worth noting is the foam cell that's shown here. Uh, foam cells actually tend to feed upon cholesterol. They have uh, macrophage activity that causes them to increase in size. And eventually that's what is the precursor to forming fatty streaks. Even in adolescence, we're seeing more and more fatty streaks forming. And eventually they are going to develop what is known as uh, arthrosclerosis. And that's never a good thing. Uh, the only things that have been shown to slow down the process of arthrosclerosis is to dramatically change your diet to a plant-based diet. And I don't know too many people that like to adhere to a plant-based diet voluntarily. There are some that are able to do that. Uh, stopping smoking will slow it down. 
And of course, exercise only benefits it to a certain degree. But one of the only things that's been shown to actually reverse is a plant-based diet. Just a reminder here, I know it's a throwback from way back in school, but uh, when you're talking about blood flow through the pulmonary vasculature, you've got blood in the microvessel, in the capillary itself, that is in contact with an alveoli about 0.75 seconds. It only takes about one third of that time, about 0.25 seconds, for oxygen to transmit across the alveolar capillary membrane. And CO2 actually travels faster. Uh, CO2 actually has a 20 multiple diffusion efficiency above oxygen. And that's why we don't spend as much time talking about CO2 diffusion as we do oxygen. Uh, but with that said, think about someone with cardiovascular disease, going back to the concept a little earlier of being near max heart rate, or even somebody, let's just say, who's tachycardic. Maybe they've got a normal EKG, so it's sinus tachycardia. But what I'm trying to get at is their heart is beating a little faster than normal, even at rest because that's a compensatory mechanism. If stroke volume is not adequate, the heart compensates by increasing its rate at which it squeezes. So with that said, there is a certain point at which the heart rate becomes so fast that we're at a equal, equal ratio between uh, capillary transit time and oxygen diffusion time. And that's a very dangerous place to be. In other words, the blood flowing by the alveoli is only in contact with that alveoli um, about 0.75 seconds under normal circumstances. It only takes oxygen about 0.25 seconds to cross over. But if that blood supply is only in contact, let's say 0.25 seconds, then oxygen is going to take the exact amount of time to transfer over, meaning if my heart rate increases beyond that, they're going to have sensation of shortness of breath. And we affectionately know that as dyspnea. And patients can easily end up in cardiac arrest just by uh, an acute overload at that snapshot in time. Uh, back to the idea of a decrease in flow through a, a partially or even near fully occluded uh, vessel. When cholesterol first starts to build up, it, it's rather malleable. It hasn't developed into what we call arteriosclerosis, actual hardening of the arteries. But over time, you've got migration of these smooth muscle cells that actually form a, a large capsule. And here you have hardening of the arteries, so to speak, where I've got the picture of a hard calcified cholesterol, um, atheroma as it's called. So this is the only surface area through which blood can flow. So this is the early stages here. These are the latter stages. And it's no surprise that someone in the latter stages of arteriosclerosis has a very hard time doing any physical activity. And remember, if we're talking about this situation in the large vessels, let's fast forward to the smaller vasculature. And now I'm putting them on mechanical ventilation and compressing the small vessels. It's a real problem. Here it is with a little different coloration. So you can see the different levels of the atheroma. And this is the smooth muscle tissue that is uh, sort of layered on the outside, uh, trapping in all of this cholesterol. And occasionally you have a breaking off of this plaque and that's what causes things like emboli and strokes. So this is just a really simple version, maybe a cartoon version uh, of just the types of heart disease. Um, everyone probably that's dealt with a surgical intensive care unit in some way has dealt with an aneurysm or a triple A repairs it's called and um, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Uh, there are others that are more common than not. Cardiomyopathy is so pervasive these days. Heart failure, as I already mentioned. Um, there is a newer diagnostic test on the market that is relatively non-invasive called a calcium scan that we're seeing more and more patients get on occasion. Um, the, the, the gold standard is still going to be the the angiogram. And of course, uh, you can uh, see some of the cardiovascular disease uh, items that we mentioned on just simple chest x-ray or, or CT scan. I don't know if any of you used up to date. Uh, again, I'm not trying to promote anything in particular. It just happens to be some of the software I have access to. Um, according to up to date, the global prevalence of hypertension, and we haven't talked much about that yet, um, is very high. And you notice it is the most common reason for office visits and for use of chronic prescription medications. The American Heart Association, roughly five years or so ago, maybe seven years at this time, they completely overhauled what they consider to be hypertension. And it's no longer above 120 over above 80. Uh, 
uh, hypertension is considered when you hit 120 and when you hit 80 diastolic. So normal blood pressure is less than 120 over less than 80. And you can see here roughly one half of hypertensive individuals do not have adequate blood pressure control. And that's a scary thing. It's called a silent killer for a reason. Uh, so just in short, let's talk about blood pressure for a moment. Anything that causes an increase in heart afterload is going to cause an increase in blood pressure. Now, there's a difference between right-sided increase in pressure, which is right heart or more pulmonary uh, hypertension, versus an increase in left-sided heart pressure, which is more systemic, known as true systemic hypertension. Which is worse? It really depends on the severity, and it depends on the stage uh, of, the, of the process itself. So just as an example, uh, mathematically, to determine blood pressure, it is a function of cardiac output factored in with systemic vascular resistance. Another way to say systemic vascular resistance would be left heart afterload. And what kind of things create an increase in left heart afterload is anything that causes a dampening, uh, a resistance, a dampening of the flow, I should say, or a resistance to blood exiting the left ventricle. And so what is the, uh, the major issue with an increase in blood pressure? Well, an increase in blood pressure indicates that the heart is under continuous uh, enhanced stress and strain. It's sort of like the obstructive sleep apnea patient that they really don't know what the issue is. Yes, they wake up with occasional headaches. They gas themselves awake. Uh, their partner says that they're always snoring. Uh, but other than just feeling uh, terrible, uh, they don't perceive that they have an increase in blood pressure. Well, what's happening is as the blood vessels constrict because of hypoxemia, um, you're going to have the heart that must compensate by working harder to move the blood flow forward. I know this, this seems, uh, you know, at this point in the talk to be a little bit more uh, complicated for, you know, 815 on a Sunday night that we need, but I, I want to concentrate just on the structure itself. What you see here is the vein, which is a capacitance vessel that has the integrated one-way valves that allows blood with some degree of efficiency, actually a fairly good efficiency without uh, cardiovascular disease to move in a, a unidirectional form against gravity. And then you have the arteries that are multi-layered with a thick layer of muscle tissue, smooth muscle, that allows there to be uh, the titration of, of various pressure according to demand. Well, at the muscle tissue itself, you have these micro vessels, these capillaries, not too dissimilar to what you have in the lung, but this is at the muscle tissue, the skeletal muscles. And you have these sphincters. These sphincters, what they found in end-stage diabetes is there's not, they're not quite as reactive. And so blood pressure isn't modulated with as much efficiency as in a non a diabetic patient. Just something I thought was quite interesting. I mentioned Pessoy's law a moment ago. Um, basically, Pessoy's law has determined that there are three factors that affect uh, blood flow in a, in, in a vessel. They are diameter. It is the length of the vessel and the blood viscosity. Blood viscosity really doesn't change that much acutely unless we're actively giving fluids or we're diuresing. Um, it can change over time. You can have somebody that becomes polycythemic and their blood viscosity increases. Therefore, that increases the workload on the heart. Uh, but what we can change almost immediately, and we do it often, especially on mechanical ventilation, is the diameter in a single vessel. Uh, case in point, if I take someone who is suddenly placed on mechanical ventilation at a five centimeter water pressure peep, and during each inspiratory uh, portion of the total cycle time, I am increasing pressure significantly above even baseline PEEP, I can guarantee that the diameter of the vessel is decreasing. Well, what that does in the lung tissue is it decreases the cross-sectional area of the micro vessel. So you've got pulmonary vascular resistance that's shooting up, which creates an increase in right heart afterload and therefore left heart filling is impaired. And so be aware when you place somebody on mechanical ventilation, certainly cardiac output under a majority of circumstances is going to uh, decrease. So back to this idea of right-sided hypertension known as pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension is quite interesting, uh, not all that similar to systemic in that with pulmonary hypertension, it is a cause of 
of not only the hypertrophy of the smooth muscle cells, in other words, they're getting larger, but you also have uh, hyperplasia, which is an increase in the number of cells being laid down, which they become layered and they decrease all in all the internal lumen here. And so you have very little uh, surface area for blood uh, to flow and, and therefore the increase in pressure is significant enough to create the right heart hypertrophy muscle and therefore in the long run not only is the pulmonary artery itself uh, hypertrophied in the internal lumen the muscle tissue layer but you also have the right ventricle that becomes hypertrophied and this is again where you start walking into a patient's room and noticing that they have jugular venous distension they have pedal edema they might have hepatomegaly they may even have um, ascites or anasarca, where their abdomen is distended with fluid because of simple right heart failure. Now, yeah, it could be from low albumin or, uh, you know, malnutrition, but, you know, look for these things in your patient. Here's an example of pulmonary hypertension without knowing their complete history, without being privy to their electronic health record. I can glance at this patient and I know, first off, I do not see cardiomegaly here. If you look at the cross-sectional area between the uh, transthoracic to transcardiac, I do not see any evidence of an enlarged heart, but I immediately see a very prominent pulmonary artery on both sides, or at least the pulmonary vasculature is quite prominent. And I am not able to trace it all the way to the periphery in every area. You could actually see arguably some degree of mild hyperinflation in the upper lobes, but this would be a patient I would immediately think possibly they have pulmonary hypertension or what we know as right heart afterload, an increase. Look how wide that pulmonary artery is. And you're looking at the hilar region. Sometimes when the hilum is full, you have prominent parahylar region. That may indicate they have potential pulmonary hypertension. So as a friendly reminder, as we sort of come to a close here in a few moments, low oxygen at the lung causes pulmonary vessels to constrict. Hypoxemia, hypoxia in the lung tissue causes vasoconstriction. Well, it's good that it redirects blood to the good alveolus, right? The shunting that occurs is something that we uh, find desirable in the short term, but in the long term, this is not something that's going to benefit right heart afterload. It's going to create an increase in load on a continuum on the right ventricle. Here's an example of something known as cephalization, also something you can look for in your practice when you look at a chest x-ray. Now, obviously, uh, just for you super clinicians in the room, you immediately notice the patient is intubated. They have a central line in place. Looks like at that near the cavoatrial junction. You've got your uh, EKG leads here. Uh, there's obviously an OG or NG tube. Yes, they have a prominent cardiovascular uh, system, maybe cardiomegaly. It's difficult to tell, but just from first glance, they do have some cardiomegaly. But what I'm trying to say here is you've got prominent vascular markings in the upper lobes. They call this cephalization. When you see prominent vascular markings in the upper lobes, more so than the lower lobes, and it's against gravity, that is almost always an indication of some degree of pulmonary hypertension or what we call right heart failure. I can almost guarantee you this patient has jugular venous distension. Some other things to keep in mind clinically, as we uh, come to a close here, just to kind of whet your appetite and getting back to bedside the next few days or few weeks, um, anytime that the chest wall is impeded in its expansion, anytime there is compression, whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic, um, you can suspect that this particular patient with pectus excavatum is going to have a compression of the great vessels in the thorax and therefore an increase in afterlobe. Uh, this is an example of what I keep mentioning, jugular venous distension, very prominent neck veins. Now, if the patient is having a bowel movement, if you have upset the patient, if they are taking in a deep breath and straining for whatever reason, uh, but if they're at a relaxed state in the bed in the semifowler's position and you see a prominent jugular vein, that indicates whether it's chronic or acute, they are in right heart failure or some degree thereof. Um, this is just an example of what we rarely see in an adult is acrocyanosis. Now, in the neonate, sure, we see acrocyanosis, especially postpartum immediately. Uh, hey, they can still get an APGAR of nine with acrocyanosis. But in an adult, if you see acrocyanosis, um, most likely they have a circulatory impairment. It's not necessarily hypoxemia, hypoxia. It could be circulatory. Um, this is something called xanthelasma, and it's one of the 
uh, superficial indicators that somebody has hypercholesterolemia. These are actually fatty deposits. Uh, some of this is genetic, but majority of the time when you see someone with fatty deposits in their face, as you see here, known as xanthelasma, they have hypercholesterolemia. If you have hypercholesterolemia, significant levels thereof, you're most likely going to develop cardiovascular disease. And by the time you have this outward manifestation, arguably you probably already have cardiovascular disease. I couldn't end tonight without talking a little bit about digital clubbing. They still don't clearly understand the physiologic mechanism, but what they've postulated is it has to do with venous arterial anastomoses, this uh, collagen, this uh, scar tissue that forms at the very end of the phalanges. And it affects not only the fingers of the hand, but it affects the toes as well. Absolutely, it typically indicates hypoxia. It indicates chronic hypoxia, but it could be from circulatory impairment. Remember, oxygen still has to be delivered, even though the source may be normal. If the delivery mechanism is impaired, the patient can still have hypoxia. This is a really extreme example of uh, kyphoscoliosis, very something very similar that my uh, grandmother on my father's side had. Uh, she was terrible COPD, kyphoscoliosis, and some other things, uh, lung disease. But you can see here that we were going to have some degree of compression, particularly of the left side of the great vessels. Notice it's moving towards uh, the left here. On the right side, you could have some uh, inadvertent uh, compression just from that pulling, that tethering of different uh, great vessels and, and just compression against the mediastinal uh, structures. And look, guys, a friendly reminder, manually checking heart rate is not illegal. If you've got somebody with suspicion of particularly an arrhythmia, or certainly if they've got a longstanding history of cardiovascular disease, don't depend on the pulse ox to check their heart rate. Just take a moment and palpate. At least go 30 seconds and multiply it times two. And look, in closing here, all respiratory therapy to some degree will alter preload, afterload, and contractility. It's good that we all are aware of this moving forward. And I think it should be front of mind because we're dealing with the number one cause of death and disease in the world and certainly of the U.S. I thought this was uh, funny in a cheesy way. It's our uh, most portable tank. It only lasts three minutes. So a quick case study to end things tonight. You're the only RT working on the pediatric floor when you're notified of new orders, changing a four-year-old patient from 1.25 mg albuterol via handheld to 0.63. After checking the PICS, as you know, there's no Zopinex available. So you contact the pharmacy and guess what they say? There's only 1.25 available. It's going to be sent through the tubing system in an hour. Well, all you have to remember is Zopinex has more receptor site affinity. Take the Zopinex, use a half unit dose. It's going to give you the equipotency of the 1.25 albuterol. And we're almost out of time, but just a reminder here, clinically significant cardiovascular effects from Zopinex. Yes, there is uh, no myth here. This is from the manufacturer's insert. So even though we like to give Zopinex because it, quote, has less cardiovascular effects, it's still a side effect nonetheless. And you can see here, it should be used with caution in patients with cardiovascular disorders, especially those with hypertension, arrhythmias, and coronary insufficiency. One last little study here, a little is an understatement. They looked at 169,000 adult patients with COPD over multi-years. And what they concluded is long-term fine particle matter exposure was associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease death among adults with COPD. I found that so interesting. We're out of time tonight. I just want to leave you with a few things here as we glance through. Um, we're still learning a lot about the long-term effects of coronavirus. This was a systemic uh, review done uh, near the onset. It's worth a read. It's free online. This is from the Cochrane Library. Um, it was a systematic review. Uh, they looked at hundreds of studies, and they saw that hypertension, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, highly associated prevalent in people hospitalized with COVID. They're just at higher risk and an individual risk factor, by the way, um, for acute myocardial infarction and stroke. Here is something you don't see every day. This is a patient who actually had a heart transplant and they left the native heart in. This is his original heart with a large aneurysm and they put the extra one to the side here. You don't see that every day. Uh, just for you ECMO uh, therapist out there, this is something that was recently published just a couple months ago in the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine. 
And I assume Mr. Barnes is going to give you a copy of the PowerPoint if you request it. Uh, just in summary here, be aware of the likelihood, yes, you're going to have patients with CV disease and complications. You're going to have to get creative and be kind. Remember, your patient has no choice really in how they're cared for, but you absolutely do. And with that, I'll open it up for uh, Mr. Barnes if you'll have questions, however it usually works.